And we've been in a series talking about all things new. We want God to do a new thing in us, a new thing in our hearts and in our lives. How many want God to do a new thing in you? And uh, I guess out of any message I have preached in this series, and really, uh, I want you to get the importance of this message today. So if I can get your undivided attention, and I just want us to pray the next few moments that we have together, that God will really speak to us and to our hearts. It's not going to be an easy message for me to preach, but I know the Holy Spirit will preach through me. What I mean by that is it might not be easy for you to listen to, but we need to hear it because it's the Word of God. And I have to rightly divide the word of truth and deliver that truth. And so I want us to soak this in today. I want us to receive of the Lord. I know some of you will hear it in different ways than others. God's going to speak to your heart. He's going to show you something in your life that He wants to minister in your area and on your, in your life different than somebody else. And so it's going to come in different ways, but God's going to have His way today. I know His Spirit's here. We just agree with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, this, this Word is a book of life. Lord, I pray that it would become alive in our hearts today, Lord. God, that You would help us. Help me, Lord Jesus. Lord, as I preach this Word, God, that I don't preach it in my own strength, but Lord, by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, speak through me, I pray. Lord, every opportunity I have to stand before this congregation, Lord, I don't take lightly, and I take it, Lord, as, as, an, as an opportunity and, and a responsibility, Lord, to preach the Word of God. Yes. Lord, when I was ordained, and I had men of God lay hands on me, and they said, they charged me with that Word, preach the Word, and they handed me a Bible and said, the young man, you go preach the Word and you do it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. For that's my desire today, to preach Your Word under the anointing of Your Holy Spirit. Make this Word a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It will hide it in our hearts and we won't sin against You. In Jesus' precious name we all say, Amen. 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 And amen. amen. Joshua is leading the children of Israel into the Promised Land. Moses has died the children of Israel had to let go of that. They had to let go of the past way of doing things, the past way of following after Moses all those years. And finally, they crossed the Jordan River. And, and there's, there's Joshua and the Israelites, and they begin to eat the produce of the land. No more manna. They've been eating manna for 40 years. They didn't put the McDonald's drive through a thousand times. They're tired of cheeseburgers and french fries. Hello? Anybody ever been there before? One more Happy Meal. I can't do it. We've got to get some real food here. And, and now they're eating the produce of the land. And they're starting to eat off the land. And, and, and they're learning a new thing. A new day. Look at your neighbor and say it's a new day. It's a new day for them. And, and, and here they are. And, and all of a sudden, they see this. They come into this area where this, there's Jericho. They want, to, they want to go into Jericho and occupy the land. And there's this 30 foot wall that's keeping them out of Jericho. And the Jericho people are inside the wall. They're safe and secure. They've heard about Joshua. They've heard about how God was with them. And fear has overtaken the land. They're afraid of Joshua and Israelites because they know God is with them. And something's, something's about those people. How many know when you're around a child of God that's on fire for God, there's something about that person that you just want to be around? There's something about them. There's the power of God on their life. That, that you know that if you don't get right with God, you're almost scared by it. That's, well, that's what these people were like. But at the same time, they knew that, that, they, that these people were coming and taking to occupy the land. And so there was a great fear over the land. Well, we, we talked last week about how, how God said, I'm going to deliver Jericho into your hands, Joshua. So don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. And they marched around the wall. He did all God asked him to do. How many times he marched around the wall that last day? Seven times. And what happened? They blew the horns and they shouted. And, and all of a sudden, the walls of Jericho came crashing down. And they occupied Jericho. And now so that's where I want us to be right here. I'm going to follow up right there. Verse 27 of chapter 6. If you got chapter 6, verse 27 of Joshua. I want you to stand with me for the reading of the word of the Lord. I know you're comfortable and all set there. But I want you to get this with me. And if you have a piece of paper or pen, I want you just to jot things down. Not that my words are great, but that God's Holy Spirit will speak a word to your heart. And you want to write it down. Write it down that God spoke that to you. And let God minister to you a word and message to you today. Now this is where we are. Verse, chapter 6, verse 7. So the Lord was with Joshua and fame spread throughout the land. The message version says he became famous throughout the land because of what had happened in the walls of Jericho and overtaken the city of Jericho. And then we pick it up at the beginning of verse of chapter 7, verse 1. You see that? Everybody say, oh, amen. amen. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully. Everybody say unfaithfully. 
in regard to the devoted things, Achan, son of Carmi, son, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of, the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Look at your neighbor and say, the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Ava, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the people will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not, do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. So about three thousand men went up, but they, they, they were rooted by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries, struck them down on the slopes, and at this the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground. And here's the, the man that's famous across the land. He, he, to the ground before the ark of the Lord remained there till evening. The elders of, the, of Israel did the same, sprinkled their dust, sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay there on the other side of the Jordan. Or what can I say now? Now that Israel has been routed by its enemies, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe us, wipe our name from the earth. What then will you do for your great name? Then the Lord said to Joshua, what do you say? Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. You need to see the good life. I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to say to them, get ready to see God move. Did you believe that when you said it? In Acts chapter 11, if you want to go there with me, you can, but I'll read it for you. In Acts chapter 11, there was a, a tremendous thing that happened with Peter. He's, he's, he's a, I had an opportunity to, to share the gospel. And what I want you to see is that God uses people. Look at your neighbor and say, God wants to use you. So, so get ready to move because God wants to use you. Peter is sharing with the other disciples what had happened uh, to the new believers in Joppa. He, he's sharing about the experience that he had and, uh, and he's sharing it with the disciples. And down in verse 11, it says right here, it says, Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going to them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house, and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring a message. Everybody say, Peter's going to bring a message. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Pastor, why are you bringing that up? We're talking about Joshua's rights. Because I want you to see something, how God uses people many times to move through His people to somebody else's, in somebody else's life. How many of you had somebody in your life God ministered to you through another person? Amen. Hello? Amen. Showed you, ministered to you, uh, shared, your, shared a word, sung a song, whatever they did, how would they minister to your life? They, they, God ministered through a person. And you should ask, why didn't the angel just tell the man how he and his family could be saved? It is it possible that the angel didn't want to deprive Peter of one of the most exciting spiritual adventures you can ever you can ever have? What is the most exciting spiritual adventure you can have? I believe that for me it was is when I first was able to to share my faith with someone and they came to know Jesus Christ as a personal savior and a personal Lord. There is nothing like leading someone to Jesus. There's nothing like leading, sharing your life, letting this word be unveiled out of your heart, out of your experience in, in, in everyday life, letting them see the word of God in your life, and they turn and say, I need what you have, and they find Jesus Christ to be Savior and Lord of the Lord. That is an exciting thing that can happen in the Christian walk. And you need to understand that, that the power of God, He wants to use you. He wants to use people, and many times He will use people to get across His message. I remember the first person led to Christ. Man, what a feeling of, of realizing that God's love had, was, had flowed through me to make a difference in someone else's life. What an amazing opportunity. There's nothing like it. So whatever the reason the angel sent for him, Peter showed up. The angel Lord sent for him, Peter showed up. And when Peter showed up, God showed up. Amen. And I want you to realize the importance of your life. 
of you when God calls you to speak a word to someone, when God calls you to, to show an act of kindness to someone, if you show up, God's going to show up and God's going to do something wonderful for that person. God's going to do something amazing for that person. The Holy Spirit was poured out and the gifts of the Spirit was poured out upon these non-Jewish people and convinced Peter that Gentiles could be saved as well as Jews. In, verse, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says this in verse 4, I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But God is the one who made it grow. It's so not important who does the planting, or, or nor who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. So let me say it again. Get ready to see God move. Everybody say, get ready. Get ready. The key words in that statement right there is get ready. We must get ourselves right. We must get ourselves ready if we want to go to the next level in God. How many want to see this church be a tool that God can put in His hand to reach lost people for Him? How many want to see that happen? Oh, gosh. <laughs> God, help us to be that tool, the tools for Your kingdom, Lord. Lord, just pick us up and use us. God, shake the dust off of us and clean us up. Lord, help us to get ready, God, to be used for You, to reach, to reach lost people for You. We as a church must get up. We must get ready. We must get right. How many are praying for your finances? How many are praying for your health? How many are praying for, for your unsaved friends and family lo and loved ones? Amen. Let me ask you this question. How can a loving, willing God, willing God to answer your prayers about your finances, about your health, about your unsaved family and friends, He, he wants to give you a new job, He wants to bless you with His favor and His presence, how can He do these things if you have not committed yourself fully to Him? If you, like the people of Israel, and I'm jumping back to Joshua, continue to allow the things in your life that divide you from the will of God and the things that God is not pleased with, then how can you expect Him to do the things that you want Him to do? How can I expect God... How can I expect me to, to experience the life that God wants me to live if I continue to live in sin that I have asked God to forgive me of and help me to escape a long time ago? This is where I want to have to hide behind my pulpit sometimes. But see, my pulpit's not, it's not covered, so if you throw something down here, it's still going to hit me. We need to practice the principle of what Joshua and the Israelites did. Because there was sin with the Israelites. Look at with me in Joshua. Here he is. He's, he's, he's tearing his clothes. He fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening, verse, uh, verse 6 of chapter 7. And then, and then Joshua, we say, well, just follow along with me, verse 7 through 9. And there say, praise the Lord. And Joshua said, Oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan? In other words, he's saying, why don't you just leave us alone on the other side? We didn't have to try to come over here and try to experience the promised land. We were happy where we were at. We were happy in the old in the old way. We could have kept eating manna. We could have just kept living like that. We didn't have to experience the new. You know what? A lot of people are comfortable living like that. A lot of people are comfortable just going back to the way things were. We don't expect anything else from God. And we're just going to get by with, with, with it. Hello? I don't know about you, but I don't want to live that way. I don't want to live there. But, but Joshua is thinking about God. He, 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 Joshua had he's torn his clothes. He's open and he's on his face. And he's, he's crying out. But he's praying the wrong prayer. Joshua couldn't even see the reason why God allowed the Israelites to be defeated in, in Ai. He couldn't even understand the reason. He was more occupied with himself losing face before the people. He's leading the people and he's, he's saying, God, why don't you just leave us back there because now everybody's going to be mad at me. We, you, you're, you're, you know, you're allowing the, other, the enemy to take over us. And, and, and why are you letting this happen? And so he's starting to, he's starting to blame other things instead of his own actions, instead of his own, the, the, the own sin that happened right there in his own camp. How many ever thought to point the, the finger of blame at something else besides if it was for yourself? <laughs> You know, the devil made me do it. Cliff Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Let me remember that. <laughs> I'm dating myself now. I was a kid. I was very little when I watched that show. He said, the devil made me do it. Well, not all the time the devil makes you do it. And we give him credit for making us do something he had nothing to do. He just stood back and smiled because we messed up and that's what he wanted us to do anyway. It was the devil's fault. 
That's kind of what Joshua was about. He's, he's like, why did we ever cross the Jordan? Why did we, ever, why did we just sit back and just camp right where we were at? We were happy doing by what we were doing. And, and, and all of a sudden, I believe God got a hold of his heart. Joshua tears his clothes. He falls face down on the ground. He cries out to God and begins to make his case. How many of you have ever been there before in God? You've been at that moment before. Build your case before God. Anybody ever done that before? God, you're not answering my prayer. It's not working out like I thought it would. You begin to build your case before God. Hello? You become your own lawyer in a sense. Uh, I think there's an important ingredient here we need to understand how the, God turned the situation around for the Israelites. First of all, Joshua humbled himself. Everybody say humbled himself. He humbled himself. God, if only you have, have done this, then I could have done that. God, if only I had this amount of money. God, if only I knew this person. God, if only I had not met that person. God, if, God, but, God, if. We can all come up with excuses for why we don't experience the life that we had hoped God wanted for us. However, when there is an elephant in the room of our lives that keep us from being all that we long to be for in God, we're the only ones who know what that elephant is. Does anybody hear me this morning? You know what the problem is in your life. It's looking you right in the face and you wonder why God doesn't answer your prayer. The first thing we need to do to move forward is to humble ourselves before a holy God and say, God, woe is me, I'm a sinner. God, woe is me. Forgive me of all of my sins and forgive me of, 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 of not trusting you. Forgive me for living in that, in that state of mind. Forgive me for living in that sin. Lord, forgive me for living that way when you have something new for me to experience. The first thing Joshua did is he humbled himself before God. The second thing Joshua did, he got up and he got right. He stood up and he got right. Now let me ask you this question. How far away are you today from sin that you have, that, that, since you have come to the moment where you ask God to forgive you of all of your sin? How far away have you gotten from that sin when, from the moment you ask God to forgive you of that sin? How far away have you gotten? A.W. Tozer said it like this. He said, there's no private sin. Your glorifying is not good. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and then we'll, I'll read on with what the Tozer said. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 says, your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge the old leaven, that you may, not, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly un are unleavened. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. A.W. Tozer said, no sin is private. It may be secret, but it is not private. It is a great error to hold, as some do, that each man's conduct is his own business unless his acts infringe on the rights of others. My liberty ends where yours begins is true, but that is not all the truth. No one ever has a right to commit an evil act, no matter how secret. God wills that men should be free, but not that they would be free to commit sin. Coming still closer, we Christians should know that our unchristian conduct cannot be kept in our own backyard. The evil birds of sin fly far and influence many to their everlasting loss. The sin committed in the privacy of the home will have its effects in the assembly of the saints. If you miss it, I'm going to say it again. Because that's what grabbed me this line when he says right here. The sins committed in the privacy of the home will have its effect in the assembly of the saints. The minister, the deacon, the teacher who yields to temptation in secret becomes a carrier of moral disease whether he knows it or not. The church will be worse because one member sins. The greatest sins of all are pride and self-righteousness. I really don't believe Jesus came preaching when He lived on, when he lived on this earth in physical body. I don't believe he was, he was preaching, Stop your beer guzzling and your dope smoking. I don't believe he was saying that. I believe he was, he was telling us that all these desires that you have in the natural, in the, in, in the physical form, when the heart is the matter, is, in, in, when the heart of the matter is taken care of and you repent, therefore you, there's a means of humbling yourself before the mighty hand of God to acknowledge one's sinfulness in light of the glorious holiness of God. When you look at the holiness of God and you ask God to forgive you and you repent, 
Those, those desires go away. Those desires are no more because you're hungry for God. You're, you see, the old is gone, the new has come. God says, I, I've taken the old nature of man and I've, I've put it under the blood and I've got all things are new in my name. All things are new in Jesus. And so there's, there's no more of that, that sin that should abide. We need to get it right. We need to plead God, be, immersed, be merciful to me as a sinner. That is true repentance. We need to get it right. We need to humble ourselves and stop making excuses and get it right before a holy God. Amen. Amen. I don't know what else to say. I don't know how else to say it. I feel like I could preach it so I'm blue in the face, but until we get right with God, we can't expect God to bless us. Amen. Until we get right with God as a church, we can't expect God to grow in this ministry. We've got to get right with God. We've got to be serious about God. And God is so serious about this thing. And I know I'm using an Old Testament story here about Joshua, but I believe it's true for us today. He is so serious about this thing. If we don't get right with God, He's going to allow, He will allow the curses to continue and He will, you will, not, you will overcome your enemies. You will overcome your habits. You will overcome those things that come up against you because you have no power. You're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and the grace and, and the direction of, of God's hand on your life. Amen. You still love me? Yes. I love you. That's why I'm preaching this. Right. Because it's time for us to get rid of the sin. It's, it's time for us to get rid of the things that hang us up and keep us on the other side of the Jordan when God's saying, I, I got all this for you. I, I've given you in the hands of Jericho and I will help you overcome Ai. I will put Ai into your hands. But listen, you've got to get rid of the sin. Amen. You've got to get rid of the sin. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to be serious about this thing. You've got, to, you've got to consecrate the people. And that's what God gave Joshua direction to do. He said, I want you to consecrate your people. In Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Aren't you thankful that when you come to Jesus Christ, He takes your sins and throws them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again? Aren't you thankful for that? So why do we throw a fishing line out there and grab it and pull it back into our lives again? If God wants to take it as far as the east is from the west, why do we want to get hung up on the old past and the old sin and the old ways? Why isn't God's love good enough for us? Why don't we come into, into a fellowship with the Lord? Why don't we fall in love with Jesus so much so, as A.W. Tozer said, we love Him so much that we don't desire those things anymore. Why should it even be an, an issue that your pastor would have to, to, to preach a message that said you need to get the sin out of your life if, if you're part of our church? Why don't you love Jesus enough to where you, he's, all, he's, all, he's your all in all and there's nothing else you desire more than Him? Why is that as a people? Oh, thank you, Lord. God knows that we're human. He knows that we're, that we're flesh. And He understands that, 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 that or He understands us. But at the same time, He understands that, that He is a holy God. And He wants to bring you to a place of holiness in Him. And we've got to strive for that place of holiness. We can't just be like today's goal in this thing and say, God, yeah, I'm a member of the church. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm on this. I might read my Bible once in a month. And I'm going to go to heaven. Listen, that's not what God's talking about. He wants to be in fellowship with you on a daily basis. I'm sorry if I'm yelling a lot, but I'm, I'm, this is in my heart. Amen. Amen. Preach. Preach, Pastor. Preach. Because I love y'all. And I want to see it work for you. I want to see, it, I want to see you win Thank in this you. life. Thank you. And I'm telling you, I'm not preaching my word. I'm preaching God's word. Oh, yes, it is. When I read that story, I thought, that's, that's where we're at. That's the, the people, our nation. Yes, it is. Our church. Our people in the church. There are so many dysfunctional Christians in the church in America. It's, well, it's pathetic. Thank you, Lord. And I can imagine God just turns His... Oh, it just, yes. it, I, don't, I don't know how He can respond to us sometimes. As a church, as a people that say we love God. And he's told us in His Word, if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He said, I want to heal your land. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. Children of Israel had messed up again. They were pathetic people. They were looking for other things. And there was a, there was a family that took some things, devoted things, that they, that they knew they what not supposed to take when they had opportunity to overtake the city. And they took that in secret. And so God tells Joshua to go to the people, consecrate yourselves and pray and, and, and let God bring this to, 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 the, to a service. And God dealt with that. We see that in the latter part of chapter 7. God dealt with that situation. Repentance 
Let me, let me talk about repentance for a moment. You guys understand repentance? True repentance is, is not one of us kind of leave this thing over here and then I kind of go about my way and I, I can you know, still over there and I can go kind of about my way and I, and I can still get to it if I needed to or wanted to. Or That's not what repentance is. Repentance is when I say no to that life anymore and I make a 180 degree turn with my back facing my past and I walk towards God. I walk towards God. The Bible says don't look to your left or to your right. It says make your path straight. And by matter of fact, the Bible says that God will help me make my path straight. He says take my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Y'all know what a yoke is. It's, it's, it's a two-headed thing where you've got, a, you've got an ox and you're pulling the plow. So Jesus is on one side of it, you're on the other side of it, and it's, we're working together. We're plowing in this direction and we're making a straight furrow. We're making a straight line and we're leaving that stuff from behind us. We're leaving it. Hello? We're leaving it. We're, going, we're leaving from it. We're going to something else. And that's where God wanted to take the children of Israel. He said, I want to bring you to this promised land that you've been looking for all these years. Let go of the past and follow after me. Let go of the sin, the sin nature, the sin desire, and follow after me. So Joshua is following it God's way. First of all, he humbles himself. Secondly, he stands up and he gets right with God. Now, now <clears throat> true repentance is when I say yes to Jesus and I make a 180 degree turn from, from my old life and run towards Jesus. And I would say most of us in this room, with the exception of a few, I don't know all of you and where your past is and where you're at in God. And I, I, I can't read your mail if I don't know you real well. But, uh, but I love you anyway if I don't know you real well. But you know where you're at in God. You know where you're at now. Look at your neighbor and say, you know where you're at. Yeah, you know where you're at. So true repentance is when I say yes to Jesus and make a 180 degree turn away from the old life and run towards Jesus. Now, will I see it again? Probably yes. See, pastor. Bad pastor, bad pastor. Yeah. But, but what do I do? I run to Jesus. Because the difference now is that, the difference now is because I'm not perfect yet. But the difference is now, now God knows the intent of my heart. He knows my heart. Hello? Amen. When I said yes to Him, and He came into my life and forgave me of my sins, yes, the old is gone, the new is come, and He covers my sin with His blood, will I sin again? Probably so. But the difference is, He knows the intent of my heart, and I know Him. And so when I do sin, I feel conviction, and I can run back to Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. I love you, Lord. Now the problem is, is when we get to a place where we can sin, and we still and we don't come back and say, Lord, I love you, I love you, I love you. Yes, yes, yes. The problem is we've watered it down so much, and, and this Christian thing has become so generalized, where we can go to any church, these wide open doors, and have any kind of social networking club we want in that church, and feel like we're experiencing the power of God. Listen, God is, is the Holy Spirit of God wants to wants to anoint and baptize His people in the power and the authority of a life living for Him in a holy life. And when the world looks at us, they need to see a difference. They need to see, they need, they need to see Jesus. They don't need to see something that, 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 that just any other life, any other way of living, but everything's good for everybody as long as you feel like it's right. Listen, there is a holy way and there is a worldly way. we got to find God's way. See my hear me this morning. Yes. Therefore, we strive for holiness. So, do I purposely sin? Do I purposely keep sinning? Of course not. How, how, do, how do I live? How do I know how to live pleasing to God? How do I know then how I'm pleasing God? How do I know? I got to get in this book. The Word of God will tell me how to live. The Word of God will tell me how to live. If I don't know if something's right, if something's pleasing to God or not, I get in this Word and I find out. That's why it's so important, and God's reminding me again for our church this year, we're going to get you in the Word one way or another. If you come in and you're sitting in the sanctuary, you're going to get into the Word of God. Amen. I don't know if we need to do an accountability thing, or I don't know what it is, what's going to take, but you're going to get in the Word of God, and I'm going to preach the Word of God, and you're going to know the Word of God. And I'm not going to apologize on the day of judgment. God says, why don't you teach the people your, my word? And I'm going to say, God, we did all we, we, we taught the word. Amen. And I've got to learn as, as a pastor to, to humble 
myself as Joshua did. And, and, and we as a people humble ourselves and get right with God. And get right with Him. Do we purpose to sin? Of course not. How do I not please God? With the Word of God. I'm going to take one thing, and you can throw something at me if you want to, and I'll block it and I'll throw it back at you. But listen, is it okay if I drink alcohol? That's, that's one thing. I'm just going to throw one thing out there. Listen, even though there's no direct scripture that says, no, I, I do not drink, the Bible still has much to say about the issue of drinking alcohol. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with what? Hello, the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That, that's just one thing. I could take several other things. I could take, I could, I could take any sin. The issue is not so much is it God's will or is it not. I can kind of, I can kind of tiptoe around it. And if it's not definitely in the Word of God, then it must be okay to do that. Listen, why are you living there? Why aren't you living in a place where God, I want you more than anything, and my desire for you far outweighs my desire for a stupid drink of alcohol or a stupid anything else in my life? I let go of that. And I look to you, God. I desire you more than anything else. God, I want your word. I want your Holy Spirit. I want to fall in love with you again, Jesus. I don't need that mess in my life anymore. Hallelujah. Why can't we live that way? Why can't we get there? Why do we still have to tiptoe around and, and try to figure out a way to do the things that we used to do and want to still do? It was because we don't have a true, a true encounter with the living God. Somehow we've, we've, we've allowed ourselves to believe that a, 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 a make-believe, a, a substitute thing has happened in our life. We think that's God, but it's not God. We think we can live both ways with one foot in the world, one foot in heaven, we're going to be all right. I still love you. You still love me? You're all right? Amen. Amen. What happened next? Do you want God to use you in the ministry? Do you want God to use you in the ministry? What I mean by that is, I'm not saying you have to go to Africa or you have to go to Bible college and be a I'm not saying that. Do you, God want, do you want God to use you to affect other people around you? Do you want people to see Jesus in you and through you? 1 Timothy chapter 3. We use this for... In our churches as qualifications for overseers and deacons. We, we explain this when we ask people for leadership opportunity in the church. But really, I think it's for everybody. It says, here is a trust, trustworthy saying, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. I'd say if you're in a workplace and you have to see people around you and you're the only Christian in that, in that lunchroom, you're an overseer. You're, you're a minister right there. Am I hearing? That's right. Um, now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, hello, not violent but gentle, hello, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, hello, he must manage his own family well, and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy and full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert. Convert, he, he, he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with the outside, with outsiders so he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I want to propose to you that, he, that we who call ourselves saved, we all carry the name of Christ. Do you call yourself saved? Hello? Yes. You carry the name of Jesus. How well, how well are you carrying that name? When someone that knows you, really knows you, when they see you, do they see Jesus? It's quiet in here. Amen. I hope I'm making you think. I hope you're not falling asleep on me. We bear His name. We don't have to call out the sins that we hold on to. I, I don't have to ask you, but God is showing you right now as I speak. I know He is. My question is this. What are you going to do about it? If God is showing you something in your life, then what are you going to do about it? Will you, like Joshua, humble yourself and get up? God said, Joshua... What are you doing, man? <laughs> he's tearing his clothes. He's on the ground. 
and he's starting to blame other things. They want to send us back. Well, why did we even come over here? You know, we kind of get caught up like that. We start blaming God for our problems. How come God gets the blame for our problems? We don't realize that we're not holier than God. We're the ones messing up. God's the holy God. Joshua got it right. He started realizing, that, you know what? It's, it's, it's sin. It's sin in, 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 in the camp. It's sin in the tribe of Israel. And if you feel like you just can't bust through a wall, you feel like you can't win, you can't get through something in your life, I said it before and I'll say it again today. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all, everybody say all, oh. all your ways acknowledge Him. <clears throat> If you're, if you're having a hard time busting through something and you can't figure out where God is and you're questioning God, I, I, I ask you, I, I encourage you, I charge you, I commend you to check your life and see if you're acknowledging God in all your ways. Every area, or am I acknowledging you with my lifestyle? Is there something that I'm doing that is not a good witness to you? I carry your name. Something you want to change in my heart, an attitude, is a, is a vocabulary change. Maybe I shouldn't use certain words. Maybe I shouldn't take a drink now and then. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe let, the, God, let God show you what. I don't have to tell, have you tell me what it is. God will show you what it is. You want me to start calling out? I can. <laughs> the Holy Spirit might start showing me some stuff. I'm not going to that. Hello? I remember as a little kid, we got evangelists come to town. And now I start sinking down in my seat because you start calling people out. Everybody ever been in a service like that before? He starts pointing at you. Hey, stand up. God's got something for you right now. You just start reading your mail. Now that, that's happened from time to time. No, I'm not saying today's like that. It's like the Holy Spirit wants to show you. Mary Alice is going to come to the piano. And really, how long to close the service today? I just want you to share um, or think on what I've shared today. I want, I want this word to soak into your heart. I love you and I know you love me and we're family here. And I'm not trying to throw guilt on anybody. But what I'm saying in my passion, my heart this morning is this. I want to see God use this church. And I love everybody that comes in those doors. I hope you know that. But if there's something not right in here, and you're not allowing God to change that in you, and it's affecting others, that I'm, I'm the sheep of the, I'm the pastor of the shepherd of the sheep, and I've got to make sure that this is a place that God will honor. Does somebody hear me this morning? This is a place that God wants to change people's lives. It's like a healing station, if you will. But we, the core of this church, the, the members of this congregation, if you're a member of the church, you have a right to strive for holiness. You have a, you have a, a, you have a responsibility. To let go of sin and, 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 and live a holy life before God. Because we charge you, you, you said a vow before the people before God. God, I'm going to honor you with my life. Now, if there's something God's showing you tonight, I ask that you would be like the people of Israel. Once they got hold of this and they understood that there was sin and God dealt with that sin, we're going to follow up next week. What happened next? Because God has some wonderful things to store for those people. He has, he has great things to store for you. You've got to walk through this and let God do what He wants to do in your life today. Let's bow our head and close your eyes. Joshua humbled himself. He got up and he got right. And then he got ready because God had something for him. Today, you might need to get something right before God. Lord, I'm, I'm not going to prolong this or to go any further with this before I know your Holy Spirit is here right now. And I ask Holy Spirit of God that you would just saturate this place with your presence. Oh God. Mm. Jesus. Let's just whisper the name Jesus right now. Lord Jesus. Lord in heaven the praise is of your people, God. Lord, if there's anything in my life that's not pleasing to you, I'm sorry. sins. Give me, Lord, for failing you. God, 
God, help me to let go of that. God, help me to hold on to you. The desires of the sinful nature, Lord, I, I commit into your hands. And I ask Jesus Christ, you be my Lord. You be my Savior. For I want to stand right before you, Lord. Before I leave this place today, God, I want to know that you're my Lord and my Savior.